Uh, we're just about one minute away, so we're going to get started. And welcome to the Data Science Day Today uh, panel, where we're going to go into an exploration of data-driven industries. And I'm uh, very lucky to be joined by an incredible group of panelists. So my name is Lauren Dwyer. I'm the Academic Chair for Data Analytics and Artificial Intelligence at the School for Advanced Digital Technologies at SAIT. Uh, and I am thrilled to be joined on stage by this lovely group of people. So we have Annette Cooper, Director of Data Analytics at Graham Construction. We have Chris Sorensen, uh, Founder and President of Iteration Insights. And we have Katie Underwood, uh, Product Manager and Product Traction Lead at Linear Labs. So, for the next 90-ish minutes, give or take 15 to 20 minutes for uh, questions towards the end, uh, our panelists are going to share their insights, their experiences, success stories, and even challenges uh, around their respective fields and data, data science, and showcase the powerful impact that data science has on business operations and on decision making. So as I mentioned, this is going to be around 90-ish minutes of this kind of discussion with 15 to 20-ish minutes of uh, your questions interspersed. But if you do have questions, if you could hold them towards the end, that would be fantastic, just because I don't want to interrupt these lovely humans and, uh, and the discussions that they're having. And with that, let's get started. So for introductions, can you each tell me a bit about you, your company, and your data journey? And Chris, you're closest to me, so I'm picking on you first. I'll start with you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, so my name is Chris Sorensen, I'm the founder and president of Federation Insights. We are a Calgary-based analytics consulting firm specializing in the Microsoft suite of analytics products. Uh, draw the lines around those products however you see fit because they're constantly changing because of the marketing departments out there uh, in the software industry. Uh, I've been part of the Calgary data ecosystem for a very long time right now and the, the map that we saw a little bit earlier was uh, quite intriguing because I was uh, reflecting that back in the early 2000s, there's about four or five user groups here in town, and now there's just an explosion of community around which, with, uh, this, which I think is fantastic. Uh, I have a long history of teaching up the state in various programs and things like that. Uh, very much uh, big into the, to the academic world and helping people grow their uh, careers in data. In the day, that's how I've grown my company, uh, is uh, by finding good talent, working with them, coaching them, growing them, being patient. Uh, and I think that's what a, a lot of organizations, in my opinion, uh, need to be doing to kind of grow the, the, the tech talent out there because we're facing a shortage. And the only way to really grow this is by you know, bringing on talent that can grow this stuff up and, and work with those people. It's nice to be on the panel with you all. Um, my name is Katie Underwood. I'm a product traction lead at Thin Air Labs, uh, which uh, in the product traction services team, we uh, offer product development and software development services to help early stage ventures get to their next stage of growth. Uh, we are not data scientists by trade, but we work with data extensively, both in terms of the products that we are supporting uh, local Western Canadian companies to build, as well as uh, extensively using data to make decisions to help ventures uh, accelerate their growth. Uh, my background academically is in physics and computer science, and I worked uh, as a software developer for a number of years before moving into product management. And yeah, really excited to uh, give the, the product perspective on the panel and, and how um, uh, a lot of the ventures we work with are, are using data. Morning. Uh, my name is Annette Cooper, and I am, as it says on there, the Director of Data and Analytics at Graham Construction. We build stuff. Uh, if you have been on the southwest Calgary Ring Road for a drive, that was us. Uh, a lot of tall buildings, a lot of water treatment plants, both in Canada and the United States. Um, really big company, do about $5 billion a year in turnover, really immature on the data and analytics side, but a lot of goodwill, so that's exciting. Uh, my background is actually in psychology and in how people make decisions, and then as careers are funny things, that morphed into how organisations make decisions. Um, so I come at this from a slightly different angle, which is fun, because I'm always the person who's asking the weird question on the side. But I'm also in charge, so too bad. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. And I, I really do think that the variety of perspectives here is going to be fantastic. Uh, and, and kind of to get us started, I know data science is this somewhat nebulous term, and quite often people get, like, what is data science? What is a data scientist? a data analyst or engineer, and how is that different? They get these questions kind of 
tossed up and completed. And in each business, it can look a little different. So I'm going to toss it back over to you, Chris, to start. But what are the roles in data in, in your company? And, and how would you define data science? I'm really glad you asked that question. Uh, so data, data scientists, data science by definition to me is sometimes a little bit misunderstood in my opinion, at least, and of course it's just one person's opinion around this. Uh, to me, data science is kind of a, using your data to look forward and predict and make good decisions. Uh, but what that really relies on is having good data in behind you in which to build those decisions on. So that's where the other roles uh, start to come in and really help out. And that is you know, classically what would be called a data engineer, uh, data analyst, uh, and those are kind of the three roles I'd like to keep uh, keep things at because you could get into all kinds of different roles and just start confusing things, but I like to try and keep it simple. Uh, data analysts kind of working with the data on a day-to-day -day basis in the business, uh, often doing an awful lot of descriptive analytics. There's a whole lot of runway out there still in the descriptive analytics world. I know the world loves talking about AI and machine learning and predictive and all these things. If you, if you read LinkedIn, you'd swear there's nothing going on in the world anymore in descriptive but there's still an incredible amount of work that needs to be done in every organization uh, to get their data prepared for the dream of data science. Uh, so I think when you start getting those different uh, roles working together in an organization, you know, getting data prepared and clean sounds easy. It's a lot more work than it sounds like. Uh, starting to use and consume that data and learn about things, and then once you get that foundation, you know, then having the ability to put those data scientists in front of things to say, what's going to happen next. Let's use that good data to predict where we're going to go. Katie, similar, but not quite the same question. Like, how are you using data in your organization? Because you mentioned, you know, you're not necessarily data scientists, but like, how then is data being used for your group? Yeah, for sure. It's a really great question. So I would say that it falls kind of into two main categories. So we are both supporting ventures that have data and data science and data analytics as the foundations of the product that they're building, but we're also uh, doing not exactly data science, but more on the product analytics side to decide what we should build and whether our efforts are being successful. So we're very big proponents of uh, what we call the experimental mindset, which is you know obviously very familiar to anyone with a scientific background, where when we're working with early stage ventures and really deciding what is the right thing to build, for the right customer, who is the right customer at the specific stage of their growth, uh, we want to know early on, are our efforts being successful? So rather than having a very, very long-term roadmap and saying, all right, we're gonna set our sights over here and off we go, and hopefully in two years we'll know if we've been successful. That's a dangerous way to build a company. Uh, a much uh, safer and more effective way is to figure out what is the leanest slice of something that we can build, execute on, put in the market, and then measure if our hypothesis about how customers are gonna respond to that has been successful. And the way that we do that assessment is through using product analytics, which is uh, a lot, you know, uh, less scientific, I would say, than data science. Often we don't have an exact metric that we know, oh, if we hit this number, we've been successful. It's kind of drawing lines in the sand and being able to measure comparatively, are we moving in the right direction? So that's a huge part of the product manager's toolkit in terms of determining whether what we're building is something that we should continue with or whether a pivot is necessary. And then, of course, uh, kind of coming back to what you said, uh, Chris, on the, the roles side, a lot of the ventures that we work with have those different roles in their shops, um, you know, data science, uh, engineering, and as a product manager, I work with all of those stakeholders very closely from the very early days of a project's inception to make sure that not only are we building something that customers are going to love, we're doing things that are, that are possible, we're doing things that are um, scientifically and technically sound. Yeah, that sounds a whole lot like data science in my, in my heart. <laughs> and Annette, we're going back over to you. Like, in your organization, where is data science sitting? And, and what are those roles like? <laughs> um, so I think important context is my department is an overhead, right? So I have data science and engineering and all of those things that you know, all of you are doing or aspire to doing. But the reality is that we're an overhead. So we have to uh, prove value, not conceptual value, uh, but actual value to the business, or we'll be cut. 
and I think many of us have seen a bunch of layoffs in the tech sector recently, so that's not a surprise. So when I think about data science, I don't. I don't think about data science, and I don't think about defining that as something, and I don't think about looking for someone who has X number of years on their resume as data science. What I look for and, and think about is what I need are curious people who can talk to business leaders and figure out what their problems was. The last guy who had, you know, what's the business problem is the first thing and joked we should all be starting there. We cannot not start there at Graham. We just cannot not. I cannot be sitting around going, oh, it would be really interesting if we looked over here into this and thought about what we could do. Won't, doesn't fly. So that's what I'm looking for when I'm thinking about anyone who comes to work in my group, whatever their job title is, that is the key first skill. And then the stuff that comes after that, well, then we'll, if you have more data science background, then we'll push you in that direction afterwards, you know, put you on those projects once they're scoped and formed. But it, I really don't define data science because then I'm putting myself in a box that I can't afford to be in. That sounds very fair. And, and it also sounds like a, a question of, or at least determining what the ROI is going to be for your company. And, and like what is that return on investment for having data and having data science? So what advice would you give to either your own company or to other companies on like how to actually, like what metrics they should track to, to say like, hey, no, data science or like data is, is important here and data rules need, need a space. So <clears throat> I have one key metric, which is a reduction in the number of times I get asked for AI by senior executives. <laughs> it is a key metric for me, and put that in my performance management plan. Because that means that they're being spoken to by vendors who are trying to talk them into stuff that we're not ready for. So that's a key metric. Uh, and actually, when you talk to, like it, in, in my company, when you talk to people who are out in the field, and I literally mean in a field, right? Like in a little box, in a field, building, like a road or putting down concrete for something, they need to know, is my project on track? Is my money on track? And they, they don't want me to tell them that we could spend six months developing a model that might tell them that later or something else. Like they need to know those really practical things. Those are the things that get me sway, right? When we can actually clean up the descriptive stuff when we can get people who are working on those projects, because every day a major project goes behind, we are losing millions of dollars. So if I can claw back with the help of what a lot of people would look at as really basic analysis work, millions of dollars, then I have done a good job, and then I can make the case for, could I have this person whose return on investment may not be seen for two to three years? It's a bit of a selfish question for me as someone who's you know working on programming and constantly redeveloping programming for data analysts running the data analytics program at State. So I'll, I'll toss that question or a similar question off to you, Chris. What? How are how are you pitching? Because I know you're working with consulting. Like how are you pitching the need for data science to clients? To me, excuse me. To me, it really kind of starts off with some really simple things. Is sometimes just timeliness of information and trustworthiness. If you, can, if you can focus in on those two to start with, you're moving things in the right direction. Because uh, for, for those of you out there that are you know, in, in the data space and you see these opportunities all over the place, uh, it amazes me to this day and also kind of shows me and everyone in the audience the opportunity out there that is around data is that how many organizations still struggle to get information that they can trust on a timely basis. I was having lunch with a, a, CEO, a CEO uh, the other day, uh, and they were reflecting how about a year ago they came to this company and they said, hey, I want to, can you tell me what the sales were yesterday? And they said, well, we'll get that to you in two weeks. It's 2022. People are still struggling with these things, and that's okay. You need to start working towards getting those types of things in place, like timely information. And once you, if you get it in a timely fashion, can I trust it? Can I make a decision? Are we gonna have conflicts? Uh, you know, to me, it's, it's uh, I'll probably end my career in data, you know, still preaching data 101 topics, uh, because a lot of people still just need to kind of refocus on the basics and, and not get all, uh, you know, caught up in, you know, things that are distractions and things like that. We've already kind of heard a couple of things that are a bit distracted as well. You know, even my, my son's hockey team, 
keep it simple. To keep the game simple. Don't make it complex. You don't need to do that. You win by keeping things simple. Uh, and like I said, I always take things back to, to timeliness and trustworthiness, and if you can start building on that, uh, and you're in a great spot. And if you can find those opportunities in your organizations uh, and use modern tooling, and I'm not going to want to do the tools we use and stuff like that, you can start becoming a rock star in a lot of organizations. In fact, that's you know, a lot of times things that I try and help people with is go help that person out. They're struggling. That business process is mired in problems. Go over there and be that rock star. Grow your career right there. Uh, and they're going to love you for it. Yeah, that, absolutely. And I think you, you touched on a piece there with, with data literacy and that, that basic, you know, what is data? Why are we using it? And, and is, this, is this obviously like worth our investment? Is there, is there a return there? Um, Katie, with, with your organization, how, how are you basically describing that to, to the group saying, like, hey, this is why we're making database decisions? and data-driven decisions, because I recognize that that's obviously a very big part of what you do. Yeah, definitely, and actually what both of you said really resonates with me with a lot of conversations that, that I have with, with companies that I'm working with and that my team is working with, because it's it's so easy for for anyone, and particularly for, for startup founders and early stage ventures who are trying to manage 10,000 things to get kind of bogged down in all of the data that's available. And in some ways, it's easier than ever before to access data about your product and your business, but that can get really overwhelming. So I think what we always try to bring it back to is a couple of fundamentals. Uh, what, is the, what is the underlying why? What is the question that we're trying to answer? And really emphasizing that what that question is is going to be dictated by the stage of growth that you're at. So you, know, you might not need to focus on metrics about uh, how fast can our user base expand? You know, how, how big can we grow? What is our geographic region? If you're still trying to find your product market fit, if you're still looking for that kind of customer entity and, and stickiness of your product. And I think the other thing that we try to really emphasize with ventures is focusing on metrics that are actionable. So if you can't look at something and say, I know exactly how I'm going to change my behavior either in our business model or in the product that we're putting forward based on this metric and how it changes, then you probably need to look elsewhere. So I think that those are, those are a few of the fundamentals that we try to stick to. Yeah, absolutely. And Annette, back over to you. So you had mentioned uh, that one of those key metrics that you were using was like, your boss is coming to you saying, hey, we need AI. Uh, and, and I'm recognizing that data, data science, data analytics have all changed drastically in the last, I, would, I was going to say, you know, five years, but in reality, it's the last five minutes. And we'll continue to change that. So how have you seen, like, the role of data and the role of, like, data-driven decisions changing in your organization? So we'll talk about maybe all the organizations that I've worked in. Yes, because Graham hasn't changed much. I've only been at Graham a year and a bit, so we'll give them time. Um, it hasn't. <laughs> I think to Chris's point, like the promise that I heard 15 or so years ago when I started out has not eventuated. Everything is not automated. Our lives are not like these seamlessly running things, and all is just more and more data that we're struggling to get our arms and minds around what we can do, and there is still a big disconnect between the practical applications of data, as you are talking about, and the organization, that all of the organizations that I've worked in. So there's just this, here's where we want to be, and here's where we think we can be, and then here's where we are struggling to really turn that into business value in any of the places that I've worked in. Or we can do small proofs of concept that start to get people's brains kind of to, oh, okay, I think I can see. But then we can't productionize it. We can't make that into an enterprise solution. Because then there's a big investment that has to go on in the background for platform or for governance, the, the big G word. Right, that we then have to put in to make that into something, and so it just again looks like a, a money vacuum. <laughs> oh, and it's hard to deliver. So, I mean, I would say I'm not, um, I'm not raining on any of us. 
But I think as a, as a profession, we haven't lived up to the expectation that was there 10 to 15 years ago. And it's not because we're not all brilliant, but there's, there's some block there. Yeah, I kind of want to jump in on that one a little bit right now because it's we haven't lived up to the expectation, but in some ways almost the expectation was way too high. And, and not, yeah, it was not robots, right? Like it was automatic robots. Yeah, exactly. So the expectations, in, in, in my mind, just need to be brought back down into a little bit more check because they were way too lofty uh, from where people really needed to go and what was practical, what you could get measurable benefits on you know, right away. You know, we were just talking about. Uh, what, what's important to you, what to keep guys. And I always kind of like to use the test is, you know, before you sit down in your chair, your home office or real office now, I guess, uh, what are the three things that you need to know before you start your day? Like, everyone sits down saying, I need to know these things. What were yesterday's sales? What's my inventory level? What's my headcount? What's my, like, you've got three things. What are they and how do you go about attaining that information? Uh, and then you can start tracing that stuff back so you can now, how, like, how efficient is that process? Is it? You know, tying it back to the, the sales examples. And the funny thing is, some of these examples I'm giving can kind of sound rather academic and say, oh, that's, that's the stuff you're about in textbooks, and that doesn't really exist. It exists. Uh, so then you can start uh, you know, taking a look at some of those metrics and saying, how can I help you get that stuff uh, a little bit quicker? Is there a way to, way to automate that process? Uh, and that's where a lot of people want to, want to start. And I, I think sometimes, uh, in this case, and I'm not going to pick on the business user community, but sometimes they just don't know what the art of the possible even is. Uh, they're so busy in their day jobs, they're having such a hard time keeping their head above water that they've never really had a chance to step back and say, what can I actually do? How can I learn something to make my job better and, and help myself? Not wait for the data team to come save me, but how can I actually practically help myself? And you know, we run all kinds of different training programs that you know, when we run people through two days of stuff, they say, I wish I would have done this two years ago. Like, where was I? It's like, well, you were busy. You've got a, you've got a lot of things going on. You have great aspirations. You want to do things. We all, we all got this list of things we want to do. I got this list of five things I want to learn. I don't have time to get to because I'm a pretty pretty busy person between my work life and family life and stuff like that. And we're all people. We're all busy. How do you start getting some measurable return and help yourself? So I wonder if I can jump in too because I'm I'm kind of excited about what I'm hearing from my my co-panelists that really sounds like there's a, a disconnect between almost the, uh, the technological possibilities of data science and really finding like a product market fit, finding the fit for the customer, which is something that exists in, in every technology business, right? Like you can build the coolest thing, you can do all the coolest tech, and you can you know revolutionize whatever you're part of the industry, but if no one has a need for that, if that's not solving a problem for someone, it's gonna be really hard to get traction, it's gonna be really hard to get that to resonate. So I wonder if part of what you're describing is kind of that scenario in the field of data science where we have this huge promise, this huge possibility, but because it's such an emerging industry and it's so disconnected in a way from you know, people at the executive levels day to day, people who are just you know, sitting down at their chair and they're like, I, I need to know my sales. I don't, I don't care about data science, I just need to know about my sales. You know, I wonder if we as practitioners can do a better job of kind of connecting those dots for people, right? And really starting from what is the need of the target audience and then demonstrating how that can be fulfilled. Yeah, and you, I can't blame a, a district manager or something for not knowing how to interact with our products, right? This is new stuff that they haven't seen before, and so we might throw something in their way, and like, I don't know what this is, like, you know, and lack of time to maybe be able to do that. And again, I go back to, I think that more data science don't define that because we're actually in a people business. We think we're in a data business, but we're in a people business because it's our responsibility to help people understand how data can help them, right? And so in order to do that, we have to be building relationships and we have to be thinking about someone else's point of view in the world. And we have to be not blinding them with exciting science possibilities, but just saying really practically, here's something I think can help you. Now tell me if that did. Can we build on that together? So, ah. <laughs> do it! <laughs> I, I feel your reaction there. I think a lot of it honestly is driven by, you know, I'm sure we're all on LinkedIn and Twitter and all kinds of different social feeds and stuff like that. And at the end of the day, it kind of touches back to what you're seeing, as well as the, the vendor community is always pushing their agenda 
into LinkedIn and all these forums, and then the executive are watching these things, hearing vendor presentations. I'm a vendor as well, so, but I like to consider myself being a little bit more pragmatic and not trying to oversell people. But you know, there, there are those out there that are overselling the promise. And if you just buy my tool, all your problems are going to go away. And it's, it's hard when you're a, a, a user out there struggling. Put it, put it in the cloud, Chris. Yeah. There's no problem yeah. in the cloud. Exactly, buy my tool and put it in the cloud. <laughs> Uh, and then all your problems are going to go away, right? And it's hard to blame somebody in the business somewhere that says, you know, I'm drowning, I need help, no one's here to help me. I'll pull my credit card out and get whatever that thing is or that promise, right? So it's it's, it's a challenge, right? So trying to get those personal relationships set up, and it's a people business, right? Yep. Establish those relationships, uh, and then you'll be able to help them out. We were making that joke because a vendor actually told me that once we move their product to the cloud, and I won't say who it was, there would be no problems. This is fantastic. You guys are making my job so easy. I love it. This is phenomenal. Well, because the next question I was going to ask is like, what is the biggest challenge that you're facing in your industry, in your organization, or in, in past organizations even, around using data? And is it the ability to analyze it? Is it the tools that you're using? Or is it actually the, the people? Because at the end of the day, you're right. Like. We all do data science in some way, shape, or form. We're all working with data. We're all analyzing it. And I would argue even, I think we discussed this earlier on, on a customer and on a consumer level. Day to day, we're using data to make every decision. I wore a dress today because I knew based on my entire closet, the data that was in my closet, there were no clean pants. <laughs> so we're making data-driven decisions at any given point. What is the most challenging aspect for your industries? Maybe, well, boy, it's hard to say what is the number one, but you know, I, I'd, I'd kind of maybe list a couple. Uh, number one is data quality. Where, and data quality can be defined by across a number of different dimensions is where is it? Is it good enough? Is it trustable? Is it complete? Is it timely? Like all these different you know, facets of data quality. I don't remember the, the seven list off the top of my head. Uh, but you know, the fact that there, sure, there's lots of data out there, but is it good enough to inform your decisions? Can you actually go ahead and use it? Data is your raw material, right? So you work in construction, so you expect high quality materials. If I expect a bridge that's you know, going to stand the test of time, I want to be using good materials, right? Same thing in, in the data world. If you don't have good inputs and good quality, and the uh, phrase data or garbage in, garbage out been around forever, uh, that's probably one of the biggest things, and then you know, maybe I'll save a, a couple for, for you. I don't want to go and listen to them. <laughs> <laughs> um, all of that, and um, construction is probably a little further behind on some of this stuff. The construction industry generally uh, a little bit behind, bit behind on overall IT speed, and then you know, as a subset of that, the, the data analytics kind of progress. And that challenge, I think, comes from, uh, because we build things and they're very tangible and you can go and look at them and walk around them, and then when we talk about the, some of the work that we do, you can't do that with it, right? So I think that's, a, that's probably a big challenge for me, uh, because when you're back in that relationship game and you're, you're out in the field talking to people who are, I mean, I don't go in the field. Oh, I don't want to be in our field, but when we're out talking to people who are managing people in the field, um, getting that kind of idea across about how this can be tangible beyond the reporting that they are used to, which is quite literally columns and rows at Graham. That can, one of the key, um, one of the first key requirements I got uh, in a meeting was that it had to be printable because we've always printed stuff. So though that sort of slightly behind the times stuff is a big challenge in construction, and I know that from talking to other peers in similar roles. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll I love that about printable, the cloud. I had to, no I, so someone asked, they, they asked me for a paginated report, and I had to look up what paginated meant, because I had never heard that word. And it means printable, it's 2023. Asking so questions about the data that they're sharing with organizations and being worried about their their personal security and privacy online, but then for an organization or, or a venture that is 
relying on being able to collect, not necessarily personal data, but some amount of data about, uh, about that customer. So I'll give you a, an example without using names for confidentiality, but we're right now working with a Series A company who make uh, tools for small businesses. And right now, different users use different parts of the system and they're kind of disconnected. So maybe you're doing some stuff with your inventory over here, you're doing some stuff with your advertising over here, and the vision is to be able to use the data from those different parts of the application to actually give that customer a wholesome picture of their business. But we have a lot of work to do on the customer relationship side to you know, gain that trust of the customer that we are using your data responsibly, we're storing it responsibly, you can walk away with it once you decide to leave our platform if that day comes. We're not going to maintain that forever and you know sell your stuff to third party advertisers and so forth. So that customer relationship piece, as well as of course, the data integrity piece on our side, making sure that we are earning that trust by being responsible is, is super important and, and a big challenge that we face every day. No, absolutely, and I think that also brings us back to like what Annette was talking about earlier with that big G governance mm -hmm. and that, that big piece of, of doing data science as an organization. And, and I, I kind of want to touch on like what some of those best practices look like for you for data governance and, and like where are we as like as organizations as industries like missing out this is also a very selfish question as someone who's working governance into every piece of, of our education system saying like hey this is where you can be doing governance better and this is what you need to know to be successful in this industry so we can start oh the good old governance question uh yeah of course uh, governance is is uh, real important to kind of most organizations to be able to put those guardrails up around their environments so that you can, in my, in my mind, my, my take on governance anyhow, is to let users be able to do what they want freely within some guardrails so that they, you know, they don't accidentally start sharing things outside of their organization with the wrong people and things like that. So I, I like to refer to it as a small g governance. It isn't the, the thou shalt not or the no, because I remember I had a boss a long time ago who said, if you're just going to say no to people, I don't need you. Uh, you need to find ways to work with people and be able to figure out a way to say yes uh, and things like that. So, you know, governance is kind of getting those guardrails set up in the organization, showing people how to do the work, training and educating them, uh, and then getting those mechanisms in place so they can go find the data, uh, understand where it is, understand the degree of quality. I was just having uh, lunch with an old colleague of mine in Palomino a couple of days ago, uh, and they work, uh, he works in a large oil and gas company here, and he was speaking with glee about. The, the, the progress they're making in data governance. And I was like, wow, like normally it, sounds, it starts off very academic and with great ambitions and then go up in the business and nobody wants to do it. There's a, a nice meme that floats around on, on LinkedIn that says, who wants to high quality data? Everyone right hand goes up, who wants to fix it? No hands go up. Uh, but this organization was serious about it to the point where they're putting dashboards up saying, hey, you know, you know, VP of this area of operations, your data quality score is 23%. That's embarrassing to that director especially, or VP, especially when others are saying mine is 50% or higher. Uh, so he was mentioning how that now they've actually got their data quality scores into the 80s, which is huge, right? That's, that's not measurable progress, that's huge. I guess it is measurable, uh, but that, that's huge progress because there's an organization that's finally taking it and they get it and they're seeing the value uh, of governance and quality and investing uh, in that type of stuff. So I always like to kind of go back to small G governance, give people the guardrails, give them the tools to do their job, and then you know, go from there. Yeah, I love that about, you know, who wants to fix it? And I think that that's something that, that we see a lot, obviously, in the tech space. Uh, so when, when we're building things from scratch, if we have the luxury to work on a greenfield project, building the governance structure in from day one is always way less painful. And that's where I think you know, working on a cross-functional team and really bringing all of the stakeholders in from the very early days at the inception of the project can be extremely valuable. So if you have you know, the product manager, you have the, the founder, the business owner, you have the data scientists, the data engineers, the software developers, everybody at the table, you know, every decision that you're making about, hey, what are we going to build? You also have that component of that, how are we going to make sure that we stay compliant and build it in from the ground up? Because doing, doing that after the fact is nobody's favorite job. And then uh, I think that one of the things that um, the other things that you alluded to, Chris, is getting people really engaged in that. I think that the conversation has to be that this is this is part of the work. 
You know, and I think that the perception in organizations is sometimes that this is like an off the side of your desk task, or it's a, it's a kind of a nice to have, but it's, it's not the real work. So yes, it may not be the most exciting work, but it's going to actually enable you to move forward and you know retain the respect and the, the trust of your customers and not get sued and all those good kind of things. So it is the real work, even if it's not the, the most glamorous task. Yeah, I think it's got a bad rap, right? Like it's, it's been really viewed as deeply unsexy stuff um, because it's not AI or whatever, right? Like it's, it's just been kind of pushed to the side as this very unsexy, very hard work. Um, and Graham, the story that I have sold them is that, um, you know, if we, we want to treat our data as an asset, which means, and we have a, a large equipment fleet, right? Like trucks and concrete mixes and all that sort of stuff that supports construction. And we treat that very much as an asset. It's an asset on our balance sheet. Uh, and we have to look after that in a way that means that all of the concrete mixes don't break down at once. So that's the story about data as well, right? That we have to take care of it and we have to be thinking about it as a, as a life cycle thing and that ultimately uh, all of the data breaking down at, at one point is going to impact how well we do our business and, and how quickly we're able to get to higher profit margins. So. That's how I've been talking about governance, but in terms of practicality, we are not doing it at the moment. Just flat out, like it's just not happening. So as we move on to our new technology platform, to exactly to your point, Katie, we are building that in from the bottom of that, but it's a lot of work to go around talking about how we're then going to need people in the business to take responsibility for different domains of data and what that's going to mean, and exactly that it is not an off the side of your desk job. This has to be done properly in the same way that we change the tyres on all of our F-150s winter, summer, winter, summer, right? It's that same thing. Yeah, it's always nice when you can kind of get that baked into the fabric for the organisation, and not sound like they're, it's a task you're doing begrudgingly, but it's something that you just do because it's part of organisational success. Uh, I was you know, kind of been a data nerd for a long time, but you know, even driving through the country and stuff like that, and you know, talking about big assets and stuff like that is, you know, drive down the highway back down to Lethbridge where I'm originally from, and I see a couple of train cars sitting on the side of the road, and I go, I wonder if the railroad knows those two cars there. They're probably worth a couple hundred thousand dollars a piece. Is there master data management telling them there's two cars sitting outside of cars home that, you know, I drive by you know, a couple times a, a week and they're still sitting there? That's a lot of money sitting there, right? The answer is probably not. Uh, the, the, their master data and their organization probably is not reflecting all of their very valuable assets like their, their train. And on the other side, you know, the customer side of things, knowing who all your customers are, who, who's my most valuable customer. You know, that kind of ties back to the, you know, all these kind of tie together is the data quality, uh, data governance, master data management, is how, how do you kind of set up for good, quality, reliable analytics? And, and can you answer the question, who is my best customer? Should I be taking them out for an extra lunch or doing something extra? Uh, and if the master data man is not straight, you're probably going to get the wrong answer. And I was sitting with a, uh, I was working with a client out in Ontario around this uh, very topic, and they were talking about how they embarrassingly went to a, a, a conference and sat down with what was their best customer, but they didn't know that. And they said, oh, last year you did $2 million, make a number up here, last year you did $2 million for the business with us. And they said, excuse me, we did like over $20 million for the business last year. And that offended the customer. Uh, and probably for good reason, right? Because you should know that that is your, your best customer. So you know, that starts eroding the trust in that organization saying, well, do I really want to keep doing business with these? Uh, with this, this company does not take this seriously. They don't know about, they don't know how important we are to them. Uh, so yeah. I think that's, that's huge for early stage ventures too about knowing your customer, uh, particularly because when you're building a business from the ground up, who your customer is is going to evolve and change over time. And when you're trying to find that product market fit and see how people are responding to your offering, knowing the characteristics of the most ideal customer for your current stage is huge. And a lot of times, uh, things that ventures we work with get tripped up on is trying to build for the five years down the road customer, 
right, for the, the kind of the general adopter, and your profile of your early adopter is not necessarily the same as that general adopter customer. The early adopter is going to be willing to kind of accept a more rough edges. They have a really burning need for the problem, and they want to be able to be the first to experience the solution. Versus the general adopter customer who might need a more fully fleshed out solution. They need more bells and whistles. They need more holes of support. So if you're trying to build for that five-year person early on, you're going to end up over-engineering things in the wrong direction before you've actually got that validation. And having that data at your fingertips to be able to really dig into what are the characteristics of this person, how do they respond to the product, and have that uh, kind of baked in from day one so that not only can you see that for your own internal decisions, but then you can start to use that to tell a story to investors uh, when you're going for funding rounds and things like that is hugely powerful. Yeah, I think uh, actually I'm going to tie it into the topic here, data science, day to day. So you said ideal customer profile, something that, that we think an awful lot about, which is probably a bit more of a data science, a data science activity that we, we do, is who are the customers that we want to work with as a consulting organization? Uh, it might be hard to believe we ask those questions, right? It's like, is, is this going to be a good long-term customer? Are they are they going to put the hard work in, right? It's, it's uh, you know, organizations out there sometimes have lofty goals and expectations and then you kind of quickly figure out are they are they truly going to bind this are they going to do the right things are they going to put that hard work are they going to get up almost kind of like a uh, like a fitness trainer are they going to get up at 7 a.m they're going to do the work they're going to do it every day are they going to give up like uh, it, there's organizations out there you can put, uh, pick up on pretty quickly and early that get it and they want to do it and those are really fun organizations to work with and there's ones that you just know we're going to be an uphill battle to work with and you're constantly be fighting with them, and we don't have very many of those, if any at all, uh, but we're always asking those questions, right? Like, who, what does a good customer look like? Who do we think is gonna succeed uh, it, it with with their data programs, no matter what what, what, uh, what part of it is? And it's really no different than a, you know, a coach looking for a player. Uh, they wanna look for the ones that are gonna put the work in, they take it seriously, they show up on time, they listen, they can take criticism, uh, and they, they ultimately wanna be good, right? So you're trying to look for all those facets. So for those that are kind of, Know, getting into the into the data space, those are you know, some key attributes. You're willing to put in the work. Uh, you want to do good. You got the your curiosity. I think was one of the things we talked about a little bit earlier. And uh, it's kind of funny. We were talking you know, a little bit before here about how I, I see probably I'm guessing somewhere around 2016, 17 is where I really started to see analytics and probably the technology world really start to take a big change because of the cloud. And the cloud wasn't the miracle maker, but it did start giving us a lot of uh, opportunity to do some new things and you can that kind of in my mind started converging with you know consumers and people starting to use data more and more in their daily lives and I look no further than my kids uh, I drive my I live down in Auburn Bay uh, I drive my daughter every now and again up to COP for, for figure skating and first thing I do when we get in the car is what route are we taking what's going to get us there the quickest I don't want to sit in traffic where's the red lines on Google map because none of us want to be stuck in traffic, so there's an example of us using data. Uh, another example is, is when, you know, we're going for restaurants. Who, who, who by raising hands, uh, looks at the Google reviews or a restaurant you say, hey, before I go there, I want to look at the reviews, and I, I have a criteria of four stars. If you don't have four uh, or above, I'm not going. Uh, but then I still look at those reviews to, to actually talk about data science in my personal life uh, to say, all right, well, that grumpy person that rated this place one out of five stars, why do they do that? So I take the context of their comments and I say, I can't believe you gave them one out of five. But you like the price, you like the food, you like the service, but you didn't like this other little weird quality about the place. Like that's not a real one out of five outlier, tossed out. Uh, maybe maybe I do want to go to that restaurant. So you know, I think that we've got you know some cloud things that are helping out. We've got more and more of our, our I'm younger generation, because I'm not part of the younger generation anymore, uh, they're becoming data as part of their lives. They're using it every day on their phones and stuff like that. So that expectation is starting to come into a lot of organizations. And I'll never forget, oh boy, it might have been, oh, it was actually back when my daughter was uh, was born. So before 2010, sitting in uh, Toys R Us, and I was asking, hey, do you have this stroller in inventory? And I saw this poor soul that you know has a phone and Google and can Google about anything on the planet couldn't query their inventory system. I'm like, it's because they're sitting in front of a green screen. So, but now that's all kind of evolved. So I think you know, data is becoming more and more pervasive in our daily lives, which working in our business lives. And there's, there's a ton of opportunity out there uh, you know, for, for everyone out there. So then what advice would each of you give to a company or organization that knows they have data, 
and is just really starting that data analytics, data science journey so that they can start making decisions that are data driven. I will go first. <laughs> okay. um, I think the, the most important thing is always to start with the why. What is the actual question that you're answering? What is the underlying why that is driving you in this moment? Is the question that you're trying to answer, uh, who is my customer? Is the question that you're trying to answer, when I make this particular change to my product, does the customer respond in a way that uh, is contributing to the success of my business metrics? Uh, by really focusing on the, the very narrow singular why in each moment, I think it's a lot easier to kind of cut through the noise and be able to stay really, really focused on driving the, the outcomes that are going to be most important for your business. And that's not to say that you cannot collect everything. That's not to say that you can't gather all of that data so that you can use it to get different perspectives on your business at different times. But staying really focused on the singular question for that moment and really knowing how you will change your behavior based on that. Because really, it's not about the data or the metric so much as what is the question you're answering with it. If you're, if you're on a journey through the woods and you're looking at your compass, you, know, you don't care that the compass needle points northwest. What you care about is that you want to be going north. And now that you see it's pointing northwest, you know how you have to adjust your behavior to get to your destination. Yeah, I 100% agree with you. You have to have a business problem, otherwise you're doing data for data's sake, and there's no money in that. Um, the other thing I would say is, as best you can, to sell an idea of a little bit of patience with your organisations, because the, someone like, for someone like me, you can come in and put in a strategy, and here's our roadmap. But end of the day, the map is not the terrain, right? So we might think this is how we're going to get there, but then we arrive in the forest and suddenly there's a whole bunch of stuff we didn't realise there was a lake there or something else that happened, right? So some patience about getting us where we're getting to and that once we actually get in, like conceptually, I can draw you all the pictures you like about success. But once we get in there, often what we find is different to perhaps what we expected or, or not quite the same. So selling some level of patience as well around. Yeah, it's, at the end of the day, it's not easy. It's, it's, a, it's a hard journey, and you have to understand the terrain. So, you know, you, you know we're, we're from Calgary, or most of us in this area and stuff like that, and how many times do you hear about people that go up to the mountains and they, they take a big hike and they were not prepared for it? Uh, they didn't take water, food, they didn't wear the right footwear and things like that, and, and maybe some of you are one of them. Uh, but you just need to be prepared. You need to understand the journey, right? It's it's not a simple journey. It's not done overnight. It's it's a multi-year journey. And in some organizations, I shouldn't say some, all, it becomes a program of work. It isn't just a one-time, one-and-done project uh, that we're going to go ahead and stand up and say, all right, we're done, start getting into the project budget, finish, let's move on. Uh, it's, it's a part of every organization. Uh, it needs to be going forward because data is just becoming that pervasive and that important. Uh, it, it's not simple, and just because it's not simple doesn't mean you don't start. Uh, you you got to get moving in on things, and like say, hopefully you've got a you know, group of people that can be patient, uh, and you hopefully got some some low hanging fruit out there so you can show some gains pretty quickly because that's always a nice way to kind of keep the momentum and excitement going. But it, it's a, it's a it's a journey. It's not easy. Anyone thinking about doing it, you're not going on a you know a one kilometer hike on flat land. It's it's uh, going up on the mountains, scrambling. You know, get stuck in a snowstorm, it, it's, a, it's everything. And just to, to carry on with the forest metaphor, because yes. I love it, and I definitely have never been in that situation where I just like went off and didn't have food and we, we you know, didn't have to almost get rescued. That didn't happen to me, personally. <laughs> but uh, I think it's, it's also, to your point, Chris, about uh, making those incremental measurements and incremental adjustments, right? Like, you don't need to know enough to finish, you just need to know enough to get started and know how you're going to pivot or not as necessary. So you don't go off in the forest and for three hours, then check your GPS. You want to be checking periodically as you go along so that you can make sure that you're staying on the right track. Yeah, I just got to point out a cultural thing. I'm from New Zealand, and there is nothing there that will eat you in the woods. So I don't go to the woods because I don't want to be eaten by the many things here that can eat you. Fair enough. Fair enough. But no, I like to say, like, data science is iterative. It's, if you're not constantly checking and course correcting, then, yeah, there's a chance you wander off path and get eaten by something in the woods, which is, is not ideal. It's a suboptimal outcome, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Well, there's a, there's a reason why we named our company originally Iteration Insights. Insights do not come instantly or quickly. You iterate your way to them. It takes a while to get there. And the path from A to B is not a straight line. Absolutely. And I only have two more big nebulous questions, <laughs> I, I promise, and then I will turn it over to audience questions to, to see what, what we can pull. Um, but the first is, and like we, we talked a bit about advice and like what you're gonna do for companies there, but what about advice for people just starting out? Like people, not organizations, but students who are graduating in the next six weeks to six months who are going to have uh, an understanding of data analysis or of uh, data science, business intelligence. I'm, I'm looking at some of our instructors in the audience. Um, what is some advice you would have for these students who are just jumping into careers in this area? I mean, I would say awesome choice because there's so much that you can do. And if you're open in this sort of general nebulous world that is that is data, there are so many places that you're going to be able to go and pathways that you'll be able to find for yourself. So congratulations, only the best looking people work in data, so also seeking congratulations on that. I would say um, be super duper prepared for the fact that nothing that you learn will be useful <laughs> or applicable in, uh, in a business context, like in the context that I work in, which doesn't mean that eventually some of it may pull together, but be, uh, think of them as concepts and things that you've learned rather than a hammer with which you would like to bang a nail uh, at whatever company that you work. Be really open um, to just being curious about not having to prove yourself within the first six weeks that you've come into a company. I love the energy of young people who come in with like, I've got all these ideas. I'm like, it's so cool. Do you even know that your laptop doesn't work yet? <laughs> That's gonna take three days for your login to work. And this is IT, right? So just come at it with a curiosity about the company or wherever it is that you're going to be working. Don't run too quickly to wanting to apply your own solutions. Meet people, talk to people. You know, at careers, uh, marathons, not sprints. So you're just at the first thing, start off slowly, jog a little, walk a little, like you'll get there. And the more time that you spend kind of really looking across all of the things that you can do, the quicker you'll find the thing that is your real passion, right? You know that there'll be people in this room, because I did it too, we went way too hard in the wrong direction early on. And then had to kind of backtrack a little bit, and that's fine too, but just be open to, to all of it and thinking about how you can apply what you've learned to some of the problems, but don't be too quick to think that you're gonna solve them. I love all that so much. I'm just, I'm just gonna cheat and echo everything that Inez said. Um, and I think what I would add is, is just to yeah, double down on that this is an incredible space to be working in. It's an incredible career. There's so much opportunity both to work for established companies, to start new companies, to you know, explore in this space, be it on the data science side, the data engineering side, the analytics side. Um, and I think also just, uh, yeah, to be, be, be gentle with yourself. If you're getting into this career for the first time, you don't have to know all of the answers. You just have to know how to ask the questions and be willing to take that step and engage with your colleagues, engage with other people in the community like the, the YYC Data Society that's doing so much fantastic work. Um, and be open to learning and growing your skills as you get into your career. I think that a lot of people, um, myself included, earlier in their careers hold themselves back because they feel like uh, they don't know everything, right? And they're not the experts, so they have no right to participate in the space, and that's absolutely not the case. At whatever stage you're at, you can make a contribution, and as long as you're, you're learning and you're growing and you're keeping your mind open to expand your skills, then, then that's more than enough. And ask the question you think is dumb. Because 100% of the time, no, everyone else in that room is thinking that same question too, but they're too caught up in their own ego to ask it. So ask those dumb questions. I, that was an amazing statement. It, 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 it is, like honestly, I, I, I love that. And I was gonna say something else, but now I wanna build on that statement. <laughs> is, uh, it's interesting, so, 
how do I want to start on this? So when you're when you're kind of applying for jobs, you always kind of uh, I wish industries in town weren't like this. And everywhere, not anywhere, but not not just in Calgary, but everywhere is insisting on that industry's experience. And the reason why is because too many assumptions are made. You miss out on that why. I remember sitting in one oil and gas company at a, at a, we're doing some discovery requirements gathering, and I forget what the acronym was. Uh, they said, uh, you know, we've got the ABC thing over here. And then somebody else said, I've got the ABC, ABC thing over there. And I said, what does ABC mean? They both define the term differently. That's a problem. If you don't have a person in the room that can ask that why question and is not afraid to say, I don't know, and not be shy about it, you've got problems. Uh, and that means that's systemically going to keep working its way in front of things. So I always like to say I prefer when people don't have industry experience there because they're going to ask some questions. So I don't understand why, and I, I, should say, I understand why, I wish people didn't do this, is insist on specific industry experience because too many assumptions, uh, too many assumptions get made. Uh, in terms of uh, careers and data for the, the people that are new to it, I come to my talk at 2.30, I'm going to talk extensively about that. Uh, but you know, one of the things uh, as well that I kind of I see a lot of students, because I was, uh, taught at the state's program for a long time with uh, Frank over here in the, near the front audience, didn't want to come all the way down in the front. Uh, it was really funny when we were taught, they were asking about applying for jobs, and the students would say, hey, should I apply for that job? And I'm like, yes. I'll make them say no. You don't discount yourself out of jobs. Put the, put the job, just put your resume in, put it in there, go sell yourself on it, and let them say no. When you're going to hear a lot of no's, be patient, keep plugging away at it, because like I said, this is, this is an exciting field. I, I absolutely love data analytics, hopefully everyone can feel my passion and excitement for it. Uh, I, I love it, I know I've got employment until I retire, uh, not that I'm retiring anytime soon, uh, but yeah, get out there and, and apply for those jobs. Uh, and, and also put together a portfolio. So come up with something that is interesting that you could demonstrate to people and not just, because I know for us when we're hiring for people, we want to look for beyond the resume. I think the traditional resume is still really important. I can go get that off LinkedIn, read use, and see reviews and stuff. Give me something different. Show me a portfolio of work, even if it's something you're passionate about, if it's sports, if it's you know, some environmental cause, whatever. Put a portfolio of work together and explain what you've done. Because that's, that's creative and different, right? So you know, one of the things that we always look for when we hire is somebody who's a never stop learning person. And honestly, when I look at a resume, one of the first things I look for is what classes have you done recently on LinkedIn Learning, Udemy, whatever, what have you done in your spare time to keep the learning going? Because that's, we're in a fast paced industry. IT is moving at a crazy fast pace. You know, back in, back in my day, uh, you know, I'd read the SQL Server manual back in, you know, on 2000, I forget the old versions, 2007. Uh, and I would, that'd be the technology for three years. I wouldn't have to go back to the book for three years. Now, it changes so rapidly to the point where I've gotten out of book writing, because book writing's, you know, it's dead. Uh, I want to do videos and stuff like that that's more real time because you can change things. But, you know, I forgot where I was going with the rest of this. I mean, I'm just getting too excited now. Uh, but yeah, never stop learning, you know. Don't, uh, don't say no to yourself, make somebody else say no to you, and uh, yeah, get that portfolio together. Oh, sorry, can I jump in really quickly? About, I just really want to uh, underscore your point about interviews. Uh, I interview a ton of developers. If, if you're a senior developer and you're looking, please come and talk to me after, but uh, uh, for real. Um, and something that, that you know I've been guilty of in the past and that I, I try to do better at in job postings is um, making the po not making the posting uh, the ideal because so many times the job posting is the ideal candidate that you know the hiring manager and the engineering manager everybody knows that person doesn't exist but they're like oh wouldn't it be great if but then what that does is dissuade a lot of people from applying so really to agree with Chris's point apply for the job worst case scenario you learn something in the interview you made a few industry connections and you don't get it best case scenario you know they're impressed with what you do know they're impressed with your collaboration they're impressed with your your learning mindset and your approach to teamwork and mentorship and that's you know those things are much more important than a colleague because specific information can be learned it's much harder to train uh, that learning and iterative mindset we're looking for fit I'm looking for personality i'm looking for how do you learn do you bring something to the table that we currently don't have in the team, right? So that is to what, Chris, what else are you interested in? Because if your resume is not huge because you're coming out of school, what else are you into and what can that tell me about you and the things and how you might be if I bring you into this team, right? So I've always built teams 
on fit and then skill because you can teach skills. We can send you places to learn things, but I cannot teach you how not to be a dick, right? <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's, uh, not, not that last part. <laughs> but, uh, you know, like, in, in, all, in all seriousness, it's very true. Like, good performing teams have a variety of different skills. Mm -hmm. yeah. To be in analytics isn't just for IT people. It's, it's beyond. You, you've got your degree in psychology. I remember way back when I first got in this in the space back in the early 2000s, and I was reading an Oracle magazine, and it said, oh, this Oracle DBA has got their, their master's in uh, sociology. <laughs> They don't have their IT degree, what are they doing in this? And now I've realized, you know, coming full circle, that it takes a variety of different skills, opinions, walks of life, experiences. That's that's what you really need on a team. And, and one of my favorite coaches uh, is Pete Carroll, coaches the Sales Seahawks, any Seahawks fans in the room. Anyhow, he looks for fit on the team, for people that have, that have struggled, they have a chip on their shoulder, they get unique attributes, uh, and they're willing to be coached and, and taught things, right? So. You learn how to find those things to build a high-performing team that, you know, when the chips are down and we're struggling and the executive's upset, that we're going to find a way as a team to come together on this stuff, and not just fold up like a cheap tent. So I, I like those types of things too. So. Yeah, definitely going to, to agree with like, all, all of that. Also, as someone who has a very diverse educational background, like I also started in psychology, went into communications, what did communication and cultural studies for my PhD, but focused on social robotics and loneliness. So like, yeah, <laughs> definitely get that, that winding path, but using data everywhere. Um, I also just want to throw out there that if you are looking to upskill, uh, State has a phenomenal data analytics program. We also have a, a business intelligence program, and we are absolutely open for registration. Um, and don't worry, everything's in the cloud, so no problem. <laughs> yeah, all, all of that, yeah. No, never a problem. Uh, but this brings me kind of to, to my last, my last big question, and then I promise to, I promise to give the audience time. Um, what's something you're excited about? What's the next thing you're excited about in this area? You, you, you get like 30 seconds to think on it. No more. No less. Who is it going to be? Who's the most excited? Well, I'm excited about everything. I thought you were going to just stop it. What are you most excited about? I'm excited tomorrow Saturday because I'm super tired and my kids have been up real late because of daylight savings. But in this field, I'm just like all of you make me really excited, right? Coming to events like this make me really excited because look at what's growing right around us, and look at all the people who are interested. Look at all the connections that you can make in the community that you can build as you build a career or in the middle of your career. So. All of you make me excited, and the opportunity at Graham makes me excited because it's super nebulous, and I've got a really long rope that maybe I'll be successful or maybe I'll end up around my neck, but that's exciting to me, right? That we get to build these things, and many of you will be in coming into newer teams or newer environments. You get the opportunity to build things from scratch to really stamp your mark in, in this world and this kind of growing thing that we've got going on in Calgary. And there are so many opportunities and so many different ways that you can take this career. And really, really awesome people all around you who are wanting to learn together and work together on stuff. So I think the people always excite me. That's why I have a master's in psychology. People excite me. So seeing all of your fresh, exciting faces, good looking as you are, that's really exciting to me. Yeah, I think I'm one of the things that I'm so excited about in, in this field and in general is is the startup space in Calgary. We have so much momentum and we're really getting that, that critical mass of people who are excited to start companies and who have ideas and who are passionate. And uh, we have so many first-time founders in Calgary, which is really exceptional because I think that it's allowed us to build a really strong community where people are really sharing from and learning from each other. And the intersection of that with the data space is hugely exciting because there's so much potential for really cool solutions to very big problems that people have in the community. And more than ever before, it's, it's easy for an individual to get started. You know, you can, you can go on City of Calgary Open Data Portal and you can find all kinds of cool stuff. You can do a ton of online courses. You can, you know, join organizations like this one to collaborate with your peers. You don't need to go back to school for four years and get a formalized degree. You certainly can, and that's another amazing opportunity. But 
especially for people um, who, like, I did a big career pivot. I was working in the oil industry. I went back to school and did computer science. And that can be very daunting. And I think that I know a lot of people who have come from disparate industries and kind of coming back to what both of you were saying about having those diverse perspectives and unlike minds, it's easier than ever before for people to get involved in this field and get engaged in data-based ventures without the necessity of going through a lot of formalism. There's so many resources, and I think that's really, really exciting. Well, first off, I don't think I've had a question asked me in a very long time where I've been so stumped to answer. Uh, <laughs> but thankfully, I had a lot of time to think about it here. Uh, but, but to me, it's, it's kind of, what I'm really excited about is just the growing desire for skill and how the act is starting to build. I can really feel this tidal wave of excitement organizations and more and more starting to become more data-driven, more and more getting those data cultures built up, more and more people are wanting to learn about analytics, uh, which is good because I've been talking about it for a long time and sometimes I feel like I've been talking to a wall, uh, but more and more people are excited about it, more and more people want to get into it and it's really kind of fun to watch the light bulbs go off when people see what their possible is and what they can do if they keep it nice and basic. Uh, and, you know, I've always been big on trying to coach, grow, teach, uh, and things like that, and, and getting involved uh, with the, the YYC data group here. Uh, super excited that we're all back in person and stuff like that, because you can, I, I feel the energy when I'm, around, when I'm around groups like this to, to keep that momentum going. And, uh, yeah, that, that's what I'm excited about, the people side of it. It's not the technology. Technology's there. It's, it's honestly, a lot of it's the same as it's been for a long time. Move to the cloud, there's some better things for sure. But it's the people side of it that has me the most excited right now. So it's not the cloud. Just, just. The cloud is not the thing that I'm most excited about. <laughs> okay, I, I'm most excited about two different things here. First is audience questions and second is lunch. Uh, so with that, we will turn it over to audience questions. And we have one up back. Uh, do you want to? Yes. My mic? No. You can have my mic. <laughs> you do it. All the way to the bag. It's a lot of cardio. Oh, yeah. You're going to get lots of exercise. <laughs> So uh, I just wanted to ask, as a student, um, I, I'm really I'm looking to learn new things all the time. So, what would you recommend as like the top three like platforms or like topics you would recommend for me to like research and learn? Communication with business people. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we do. We see a ton of work in the AWS ecosystem, and uh, so I think learning one of one of the big cloud. Sorry, cloud. One of the big cloud provider ecosystems can be can be valuable um, to to get a foot in the door. Yeah, I, I would say either what well, I kind of like to think of the big three. So the Microsoft, AWS, Google. Like if you're working in any one of those spaces, you're going to find some stuff. So keep a focus there. There's a and if I missed any of them, there, there's vendors in the room. Sorry. Uh, there's plenty of stuff out there, but pick something and stay focused. Uh, one thing that I, I always remember this one student I was teaching many years ago that felt like every day they needed, do I need, these, do I need to learn C++, do I need to learn this, do I need to learn, I was like, whoa, focus, you're in class, Look, get good at the things we're trying to teach you, not every other thing that's out there, because it's very easy in the technology space, and especially now, to get very distracted. And I would say that student was probably very distracted pre-cloud, so before things really started to accelerate and change, so pick something and focus. Um, okay, first of all, thank you. You guys touched on really interesting topics. And it's funny how we kind of started talking about the people side with the net, and then Chris finished it off talking about people again. So my question is, we've, we've been talking about business literacy for a while. Now we're talking about data literacy. How do we bring people literacy into this mix? Mm -hmm. I love that question so much because really, I mean, that's that's what it's all about. It's what it's all about when you're trying to socialize things with internal stakeholders. It's what it's about when you're trying to decide what to build, when you're trying to drive data literacy. And I think that um, one of the most important things is to understand uh, understand the why. The same as the data, you've got to understand the why of the person. What is the real motivation that's driving them, and what are the most important problems that they're trying to solve? 
uh, because at the end of the day, if you can fulfill a need that someone has, either they have uh, a problem with a, a current situation that they have, there's something that's pushing them away from their current way of doing things, and you can fulfill that need with, with data, and that's a positive step. Or if they have perhaps an unfulfilled need, there is no current way to solve that problem, then that can be really valuable. And sometimes the why is not what you think it is. You know, you might be seeing uh, a behavior, you might be seeing a, a symptom, but not a, an underlying cause. So I think always really digging deeper and having that empathy for the person in their situation and trying to understand what is their context is, is super valuable. Yeah, I would say everyone in this room is infinitely curious. I think that's why we got into data, right? Because it's something that you can turn your curiosity to. So take that strength and turn it towards people. How can I be curious about this person? How can I understand the shoes that they are standing in, the problems that they have? And um, and just and listen properly, which is really hard sometimes, right? To listen properly. I um, Often I find people will say to me, well, okay, well, we're gonna do this thing. Who's the client? And I say, we're an internal team. I don't have any clients. You're not my client. You can't tell me what to do. We are colleagues who are working towards making Graham a better place. So I don't take the client mentality internally. What I take is you have a problem, I have a problem, together we can fix that, right? And then I turn my curiosity, turn your curiosity towards that person, their perspective, and the problem, and then you can apply your enormous brain to the solution. Thanks for the, the panel discussion today. A uh, question specifically to Annette. Uh, I don't imagine Construction 101 came with a lot of uh, people's data science or data related backgrounds. What are you doing to build an understanding of that within your team and then the trust with your customers? No, it didn't. Um, <clears throat> but we all live in buildings, so we have some context. Um, <clears throat> So, I, like I said a couple of times, right, we're in a people business. So, I would say to my teams, it's really not our job to know how to do everyone else's job at the company, but it is our job to have key people that we can go and talk to when we don't understand a process. So, so much of what we do is about reaching out, and Graham does a lot of different things, and they're not all the same, and you do get into trouble if you pretend that building buildings is the same as digging holes. They're not. Um, and the engineers get really upset when you don't understand the difference. But it's just that thing about saying, I, again, I turned my curiosity to, I don't, I didn't know how to be in the military, which is what I did before I came to Graham, and I don't know how construction works, but I know what I do, and then if you can help me understand better what you do, and together we can work through what the problems are or the things that you think are getting in the way, and then how can I apply my knowledge and understanding of what I do to that with you, with you, not on you or at you. If I could add to that quickly too, I think that uh, it kind of comes back to, to thinking that you have to know everything, and you can never know everything. No one can know everything about a particular domain space, but particularly if you're, you know, if you're either within an organization, you're working on a team that perhaps is is adjacent or is separate from the kind of core functionality of the business. You know, you're not out there digging the holes or building the buildings either, but still, what you're doing is fulfilling a vital function. It's more about um, knowing about what questions to ask and knowing how to apply kind of the common principles to whatever your situation you're in. And then exactly as you said, Annette, working with that person to figure out how your expertise can solve the problem specific to their domain. Because often the person you're engaging with, they're the domain expert and you can really learn a lot and rely on their expertise and bring your expertise to the table, like you said, to, to solve the problem together. I want to actually add a little bit of that too, because you know, one, one thing I really like about my job is I work in consulting. I get to see across all kinds of different industries, not-for-profits, big, small, global, multinational, work, work with them all. Uh, and what I kind of like saying, I don't know the exact number on this, is I, I feel like it's about 85% of all businesses, small, large, not-for-profit, global, local, all are struggling from the exact same data and analytics problems. The other 15%, Grab yourself a subject matter expert that knows it and help you walk through it, uh, and that kind of helps you out with that industry, but there's so much in common between everybody. Well, I sat down with a not-for-profit, and they said, well, 
you don't, I, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, you don't, you don't understand not for profits, you know, our people, our business users go out and buy software and it puts, you know, we have another system out there, we've got to pull data from, I said, everybody does that. Uh, that is a problem everywhere, so it, it doesn't matter who you are, what industry you're in, everything is largely the same. 15% different, get yourself some good subject matter experts, somebody that can help interpret, you're good to go. Awesome, thanks. See one in the back. Ian over here has a question too. I did also go to a site and I wore a high vis and I looked good in it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so, my question is that how adaptive is the current market space to the data driven solutions? So, one part is building the right solution, but other is really talking to customers and convincing that something they used in the past was good, but now this is better. So, what are your experiences related to that? Yeah, that's a really great question. And, and I think it's, it's, uh, it's a conversation that we have a lot when we're doing um, customer research, um, you know, in the scope of my work, helping ventures find their product market fit. And it's, it's really, I mean, I feel like I only have one answer. It's what is the why? What is the thing that's driving, that's driving that customer, that person? And so it's really about connecting uh, the technological solution to the problem that they're experiencing in their day-to-day -day life. Because you can build the you can build the coolest thing, you can solve the coolest problems, you can do all these analytics. It can be in the cloud, which has no problems, and uh, it doesn't matter if what you're building doesn't connect to a need for a person and doesn't connect to it in a way that drives their business outcomes. Because that's that's the other big part of it. You know, if you have just a product, that's not necessarily a business. It also has to be something that people are willing to pay you for. So understanding all of those pieces as, as I think really fundamental. I'm obviously answering this sort of from my perspective, but curious to hear, uh, yeah, hear Kristen and Ned's perspective too on how you're talking to people about this. I can tell you something I don't like. I don't like someone coming up to me and saying, oh, what are you using? Oh, that's rubbish. You should use this thing. You know what? You don't know anything about my business. You don't know the problems I'm dealing with, right? Like I don't doubt that it's great, but you've got no context of me. The other thing I think I would add is just that um, decisions in, a, in an organization like mine about new pieces of technology take time because we have a complicated, like it's a big company, we have multiple ERPs, we have multiple shadow IT situations going on, right? So it's not as easy as just going, cool, that does look really good, let's bring it in here. It, it, the, all of the tentacles of everything have to be considered. So. There's definitely something there about how are you going to, one, really actually understand what my problems are, and two, be patient with the fact that we can't make those decisions quickly. In a company our size, it just, it just doesn't happen, so. Um. Thank you. And I have one follow-up question, uh, if that's okay. Yeah? You've got the mic, just do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, um, Let's say once we have the right product, we have the right market space, we do also have the competition just like fast, right? So when we go with data-driven solutions, there are two things. Do we improve the accuracy as a selling point or do we go more, to our, more towards a different perspective of looking data, a different perspective of sol solving their problem? What, what do you think with the future? Yeah, I think uh, I'm going to give the very annoying product manager answer, which is it depends. <laughs> and uh, it, it depends, I think, on, on a couple of factors, primarily what, what is the stage of the business that you're building and what is your business model. So if you're at the stage where you know, you've established good product market fit, you have a solid base of customers who are sticky, they're sticking with the product, and now you're trying to figure out, okay, how can we tweak this in different directions to monetize what customers are doing. That's a very different situation from you are you have an idea and a little bit of money and a team and nothing else. And you're really just iterating and kind of trying to fail fast and figure out what the product actually is. Those are very different situations. And how you're going to want to optimize your data play um, is going to be different in, in those two scenarios. So I think always, all, for all things in building a business, knowing what stage you're at and knowing what signal you're looking for to be able to move to the next stage is really important and that's that's going to dictate your answer. Thank you. Oh, she's behind you. Behind you. Behind you. Wait, behind you. Behind you. Sorry. He's been waiting forever. Thanks for the talk. Of the people that you have hired, what were some of the most memorable portfolio projects that you have seen? Ooh. 
are you are you asking like what has in an interview what has somebody brought to to, to me as, as a portfolio project? Is that what you're asking? No, I'm asking for basically ideas for portfolio projects, but the ones that stood out to you in your memory. Come on. I I can't tell you ones that have stood out in my memory, but I could tell you ones that would if I ever saw them, right? Uh, and that would be someone live action showing me how they gather requirements from someone who's got a problem and how they work through a difficult situation, right? Like, this person's not understanding, they're getting frustrated with me, they don't have time, but they really want what I want, or I want to do something that's helpful to them. That would be really memorable to me. What I have seen is often, like, really cool visualizations and I'm and I'm not knocking that because that is cool but that there's a whole lot of other stuff that went on behind to get to that really cool visualization and I know we don't have that <laughs> we don't have that right but what I do have is a lot of people I need you to get to know and what I want to be able to see and would bump you up to the top of my list for interviewing was some way of, of showing me how you can do that because those are the skills that I am always missing yeah, I think agreed with that. If if you can show me something really cool, but also explain why it's valuable, who it's for, and why it matters to them, that that's really memorable and, and key. Yeah, and I'm going to just take a slightly different twist on that. Is is one because I, I do often encounter students asking about a portfolio project, and when I was teaching, I would always say, pick something that you're passionate in. Don't just go pick something for, for the sake of picking because it it's there you got to feel pretty good about it, passionate about it, because if you're passionate about it, when it comes to telling me about it, I'm going to see the excitement in your voice, and you're going to add, you're going to, you don't have to memorize it, right? If, if it's something you don't care about, then you have to memorize things about it. If you have to memorize it, then you're going to forget. But if it's something that you're truly passionate about, like, I always like to go back to environmental causes and things like that. If you can do something, you know, as a portfolio around that, you feel really good about it, you're going to sit in front of that person and exude confidence and excitement about it, and that's going to resonate, right? And you're going to say, wow, you actually sold me on that. That's, that's pretty good, right? Uh, so don't just pick something for the sake of picking something and saying, oh, I begrudgingly do that there. Get something you're really excited about. And sometimes it takes a while to get there, but get it, because once you get it, people are going to feel that confidence. Um, kind of going back to uh, change, which was asked before about customers and uh, trying to get them to, uh, or I guess how change is perceived. Um, so when it comes to employees, actually, how do you get them to adopt these sort of metrics or specifically like performance metrics or something like that? Or I imagine in the construction industry, it's probably really prevalent that uh, people are doing a job and they don't want to stop to like put data in an iPad or something like that. So basically, how do you convince your employees to also be receptive to change when it comes to implementing data? If I knew the answer to that, I would be living on an island somewhere because I would be so rich, because I would have sold the answer to that to everyone, right? Again, back to this is a people job, and changing people is hard. Like, people don't want to. Well, they do want to, but they don't really want to, right? It's a lot of effort. Um, sticks and carrots is the answer, right? And for me, sometimes it's been finding... I'm really lucky at Graham, I think, because the senior leadership are predominantly engineers. So they understand data at a basic level, um, and they understand the point of it, and they understand, um, you know, why we might want to get a bit cleverer about it. So that helps, uh, and then they are the stick, right? If you can get them to the point of being like, you will put this data in, and you will do it this way, right? Uh, but you always have to then still have the relationship with the people who are doing the typing and saying like, come on. Often it's just exposing to them the decision that gets made three steps up the chain from you on the stuff you're putting in is the decision you're annoyed about, right? They, oh, they keep doing this stupid thing and they keep sending this, this stuff to us and it's all wrong. And like, you put it in in the first place. That was you. This is a closed loop, right? So how can we get people 
all through the organisation better understanding how the work that they are doing is directly impacting the decisions that are being made a little ahead and all the way up to, to the strategic. And then um, sometimes crying. Like sometimes just crying. Please just put it out of here, okay? It's all valid. I 100% agree on the, the sticks and carrots approach because some, sometimes it's just a, a lack of awareness too, right? Like, you see out in the field, that person's doing their job, their job is being done, things are being operated, they don't see the value of getting that quality data in a timely fashion into the iPad, right? Well, I've already got it written on a piece of paper here, the, the well or whatever we're operating out here is running just fine, I don't see any red lights going off. I'm, I'm good, right? So how do you kind of connect them and make them feel like they're part of it and understand the, what I like to call the bigger data chain, right? The value chain in behind that. So it, it's hard. It's not easy. Crying might work. Uh, so it, it, it's not easy, but it's, it's a matter of educating and, and just showing them and throwing some sticks and carrots in there. And having an executive team that supports it is important, right? Tone at the top. If the executive team doesn't care, you expect that person to care? Yeah, and I, I think um, it's really important too, if you're talking about you know broad company-wide metrics, you have a key performance indicator, you have something that everyone's supposed to be focused on, it's so fundamental that that metric is understandable. Like every single person should be able to say, this is what our, our performance indicator is, and this is why it matters. This is why it actually matters to me in my job, in my function, in my team. And it should also be actionable. Because I think, you know, as I mentioned in a previous comment, if you don't know how your behavior is going to change, if you don't know what is going to be different for you based on this number, why should you care about it? And I think that a lot of times um, in organizations, it's either a matter of, you know, there, there's too many different things being tracked and, and it's not clear why these things are important. Or again, as both of you mentioned, it's just, it's not tied back to how does this actually impact me and how, when I track this data, how does this change things in my team, you know, three months, six months down the road? It's also helped, it's helped at Graham to put terrible data into reports and then say to people, this project's going really badly. And they're like, oh, that's not right. And I'm like, that's what we put in, so that's how it's going. And now it's landing on a list on the chief executive's whiteboard. You don't want to be on that list. So how about we get this kind of sorted out? I'll help you. Like, I'm here to help, right? But also say, um, probably 95% of Graham construction has no idea that I exist and that and that data work like, right? And they think that the, the be all and end all of IT is laptop boards and stuff like that. So, you know, you have to be a little bit open to the fact that a lot of people have not been exposed to this kind of stuff. So they just have no idea, right, what we're trying to do in the background, which is why you want to bring that, the roadshow of selling yourself and selling the ideas. Thank you. Uh, also, the panel has been excellent so far. I appreciate it. So far, we've still got time to disappoint you. Let's get the quickly. Let's take one last question. Yes. And, uh, my question, because we have a product manager on the panel, is um, we talked a lot about how, well, data traditionally in IT, engineering, business, and those realms, we've been talking a lot about the importance of uh, understanding customers and people and um, identifying problems to solve. Do you see um, a move from of data from more of the engineering technical side into like more product realm um, your roles? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you're not making data informed and data driven decisions as a product manager, you're just guessing. And you're, you're really not doing your product or your customers a service. So being able to assess whether what you're doing is being successful or not is, is huge. And the only way to do that is with, with product, product analytics and with data. And, you know, I, myself and my team, we believe really strongly in the value of cross-functionality and of getting all of those voices around the table. So having that, that data literacy and, you know, you don't have to be a data scientist to be a product manager, but having that understanding of uh, what are the challenges associated with doing data work, with doing data engineering and so forth, and being able to engage with your colleagues to come up with the best solution to a problem is, is huge. I think that uh, even if you don't come from a technical background, having that, that literacy is, is really important so that you can have those conversations. One of the things we've been talking about at Graham 
because when you start with a blank slate, sometimes it's a little bit easier. And we had a reporting team, right, that were building these paginated reports. That's cool. That's where we were at. But more and more, we've been shifting the thinking. We've been shifting the thinking towards. It's not really about a report or a dashboard or a model or anything. It's about a data product, right? That is serving a need to our business. So bringing some of that product thinking and that product mindset into how we iterate and deliver on these things, which should be living. Uh, like a report should never just be the static thing that goes out forever, right? So how can we bring some of that product mindset into how we deliver whatever the product is that comes from our our department? I 100% agree. And then, uh, honestly, I just had a light bulb moment off my head here just thinking about it as a product, right? Maybe that's a way to elevate data, right? And Because if it's if people hear data, it's like, oh, it's just that thing that IT takes care of, right? But if it's a product, I don't want a product. I want it to be shiny. I want the advertising. I want the marketing. I want the sales because a product is something a little bit more tangible, right? If it's data, too many people kind of discount it. So maybe you've got, you've got me thinking about differently about some things. Right? I like that. Thank you. You're welcome. Presentation. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for your presentation. presentation next year. Maybe Chris. <laughs> all your questions. Thank you so much to you three for your phenomenal answers and for giving us all some time. <laughs>